Good evening, Dumelang, Sanbonani. Our speaker, uh, Professor Mutlatsi Tabani, members of the university executive and senior management present, the director of the Center for Gender and African, African Studies, Dr. Stephanie Kawut, the program director for the program for Africa Studies, Dr. Munyaradzi Mushonga, colleagues from the Faculty of Humanities and other faculties, welcome. On the 25th May, 2023, the 60th Africa Day will be commemorated since its inception in 1963 with founding of the Organization of Africa Unity, the forerunner of the African Union. The Africa Day Memorial Lecture is one of the flagship academic events on the calendar of the University of the Free State, hosted by the Center for Gender and African Studies since the very first one delivered in 2009 with Achille Mbembe. Over the years, we have been honored to host some of the greatest African and decolonial intellectuals of their generation, including Ali Mazrui, Mahmoud Mamdani, Ngungi Wationg, Henning Melba, Alcinda Honwana, Paul Seleza, Francis Nyamjo, Sabelo Ndlovu Kacheni, Walter Mignolo, and Bagele Chilisa, to name just but a few. From 2020 to 2022, the Africa Day Memorial Lectures had to adapt to a virtual platform because of the COVID COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, this year's lecture will be the first in-person event since 2019. I'm now going to introduce our university choir to perform an African medley, Dubula Shosholoza. Let's welcome them.
Wow! So melodious. Transporting us to another planet, to another world. Thank you very much for this melodious, soothing piece of music. You have really refreshed our hearts. We really appreciate this. Tanki kialibuwa. As you heard from um, um, this melodious piece of music, three pieces shared, I think it is a clear sign of the significance and importance of what it means to be African, of what it means to draw from our, our archive. So allow me to uh, take you through uh, um, a conversation that I had with our guest speaker, you know, on Saturday, the 20th of May. This is how the conversation went. Boss, is lecture on 24 or 25 May? He asked. 24, boss, I replied. Okay, but I always thought lecture was on Africa Day. He quizzed. Makes sense, boss. But at UFS, we established a tradition where we celebrate and hold Africa Day every Wednesday before the day of 25 May. I responded. So there you are, ladies and gentlemen, to those of you who were asking a similar question. Why is this lecture not holding tomorrow but today? That is the response. So allow me to be a bit personal, because what is personal is also universal. I first met Professor Mukliatsi Tawani when I assumed a lectureship post at the National University of Lesotho in 2004. In the last 20 years, our relationship grew from friends to comrades in arms. And as you heard today, in my introductory remarks, we easily call each other boss. So hello, boss. <laughs> and welcome, boss, with your wife seated over there. Thank you very much for gracing this occasion. So who is this boss? Professor Mukhazi Tawani taught history at the National University of Lesotho many, many, many moons ago, for many, many moons. He also taught history at the University of Eswatini. He is currently a research fellow in the Center for Gender and Africa Studies. He completed a BA degree in political science and history at NUL in 1982. His master's degree also at NUL on the methodology of oral history in 1987. His doctorate degree on diamond mining in Lesotho you know, with the University of Trondheim in Norway in 1998. He participated in countless research projects as researcher and advisor. For example, he did work funded by the Panels of London to collect personal experiences of people who were about to be removed from the Mudika Diko area to make way for construction of Mohali Dam. His research interests are wide and include oral history, social history, social theory, and is widely published on a wide range of topics, including technology, land, ideology, mental health, and others. During his tenure at NUL, he served as HOD, as acting deputy dean, as acting dean, and he served in many committees of Senate and in Senate itself for many, many years. He also served in his community service, you know, in the national labor advisory body and the national wages body. Through his readings over the years, Professor Tawani has become a great admirer of Moshoshe the first and later of Josiah Hoffman, about whom, however, he has not been able to read more as the majority of publications on Hoffman are in Afrikaans. 
Professor Tawani expressed his great admiration and respect for Mosheshwe in this way. Allow me to quote verbatim. I have not been able to write on Mosheshwe the first because I have always felt I would not be able to do justice to him, his thinking, his wisdom, and his achievements, close quote. Despite this disclaimer, we are privileged to have him this evening to share with us the way and the world out there his insights on the relationship between Josiah Philip Hoffman and Moshoshu I during the 19th century in the Mohokare Valley, so that we may learn something from it today. Lihuahua, the subject of your talk today is very relevant. Given the complex local, regional, continental, and global human entanglements of the 21st century. The crisis of living together is a real crisis. And this crisis is well mirrored in the rise of world states and through processes of enclosure, containment, selective permeability, criminalization of migration, and of course, many, many other issues of securitization of borders. Wherever you look, east, west, north, south of south, east of east, west of west, you always see these processes and a sudden appetite for apathy. Paradoxically, in this fast decolonizing world, Totela, the audience and the world joining us online are asking you to invoke the wisdom of Dijo and Musilani so that they may not feel the heaviness of the pumpkin as we embark on this important process of rewilding the world from the global south. Lihuahua, Lasidimo, Wabo, Dijo, Posohela. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, the man who has just spoken here um, calls himself my comrade, but he always sabotages everything that we agree on. <laughs> He's just done that uh, now in many, many respects. Um, members of the University Executive and Senior Management and uh, Professor Rauhocha, who is with us here this evening, Director of Center for Gender and African Studies, Dr. Stephanie K. Wood, Program Director for the Program for African Studies, Dr. Munyaradzi Mshonga, colleagues from the Faculty of Humanities and other faculties, and invited, all invited guests. Um, it is a great honor for me uh, this evening uh, to uh, speak to you about a subject uh, that I've been interested in for a long time, uh, but for a number of reasons have never really got the opportunity to uh, address. Um, I feel uh, really, really uh, privileged that uh, the Center for African, African and Gender Studies and the University of uh, UFS have allowed me to come and speak here about uh, this uh, topic. Uh, we have been very, very, very warmly welcomed by everybody we met, me and my wife, and I'm very, very thankful uh, for that. Um, I've been given uh, 45 minutes uh, to talk to you. Um, if I exceed that time, 
you should know that um, it is me, not the center who are now torturing you. Um, they've, they've, they've allowed you torture for about 45 minutes. And if I go beyond that, uh, you must know that uh, it is not them. You must blame me. Um, this uh, presentation is about a friendship that formed between two great men, Josias Philip Hoffman and Moshe Shewan, who lived and became political leaders of their people in the Mohokare Valley in the 19th century. Um, it is very important for me to say this, uh, that this is a human story, a story between human beings. So no frameworks, no theories, nothing. Relax. <laughs> Just a human story. Um, human, human, but with a lot of implications for a lot of things, and including precisely knowledge. I always tell... Um, colleagues who are talking about uh, decolonization and so on and so forth, that you know, somewhere between decolonization and decolonized, there is knowledge. In between those, there's knowledge. And I think a story like this um, has a wisdom for that knowledge in between uh, those. Um, it's something we can talk about, but I've just asked you to relax and I'm going to be true to that. It was a friendship that formed, uh, can you, can somebody help me with it? What is that? Oh, this one. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. It was a friendship that formed at a time when animosities were at their most intense between communities of the two men, Basotho on the one hand, and a community of white settlers who had started arriving in the Mugare Valley in the 1830s on the other. The depth of the enmity between the two communities was such as to move one British colonial official in Cape Town to remark to his superiors in London, the Basotho and the Boers cordially hate each other. So the British and the language, the English and the language you can see there. Uh, the Basotho and the Boers cordially hate each other. These tensions were generated and fueled by competition for land. That is the basis of all human production and reproduction. It was a competition in which from the 1840s by means and in ways that Hoffman and Moshe Shawan regarded as unjust and for the benefit of white settlers the British took a lot of Basotho's land and handed it over to the Free State in 1854. The reason both Hoffman and Moshesho regarded as unjust the means and processes by which these seizures of Basotho land took place was that, among others, as was evident then and as can be seen today, the degree and manner of this dispossession was such as to or was calculated to leave Basotho little land on a mountainous terrain which is highly susceptible to degradation due to environmental and anthropogenic factors. Such quality and quantity of land would not sustain prosperous human livelihoods. Addressing different audiences, both men expressed themselves in a similar manner that recognized that the scale of the British and free status alienation of Basotho's land had aims of, at worst, leaving Basotho landless, or at best, with amount and quality of land that was inadequate for forming basis of prosperous livelihoods. Thus, as the British seized more and more of Basotho's land, in 1852, Moshe Shawan remarked to one of uh, his missionaries, that the extent to which white people coveted Basotho's land was such that if they could, white people would send Basotho's cattle to pasture in the clouds. 
during the 1865-1867 security war, with large tracts of Basuto's land lost to the settlers and being perpetually asked by the British and the free staters to remove Basuto from even more of their land. In July 1867, Mushu finally observed, if I were to remove Basuto, I have nowhere where I can establish them. Besides, I know of no country where they can go. For his part, having described Free Status 1865-1867 war aims as diabolical and intended to clear out and drive Basutu away, Hoffman asked, utterly at a loss, where can Basutu go? The two men were agreed, sorry. Okay, there you are. The two men were agreed that to resolve conflicts arising from competition of land for land that had arisen in the Mukarali Valley after the 1830s required not force and violence of military might and not power, but as Moshe Shuan put it, I don't know where I am now. Yeah, it should be him. As Moshe Shawan put it, it required honest men disposed with all their hearts to an equitable arrangement. Hoffman shared this Moshe Shawan's conviction. In direct response to Moshe Shawan's remark, as president of the Orange Free State in January 1855, he sent his envoy to Mushueshwe to present definite proposals along lines that Mushueshwe recommended. Anyone who reads through sources that are available in English on Hoffman and Mushueshwe's relationship would find it difficult to argue against the fact that theirs was a friendship that stands not as heritage, not only for us in this part of Southern Africa, but also as deserving of status as heritage for humanity. As such, it is, worth, it is worthy of study and discussion for a number of reasons. I will mention two. First, a major problem to which the two men's friendship had a great potential to solve, namely inequitable distribution of land, remains with us today together with its consequences of poverty and socioeconomic inequality. It is be still begging to be resolved. Second, the two men's friendship inspires hope against the many hardships societies of the region suffer today. Amidst grinding poverty and ever increasing and deepening socioeconomic inequality in our region, Three and a half years ago, together with the rest of the world, we were hit by a, a corona pandemic that brought fear, despair, and restrictions on our ability to administer to our livelihoods. During that time, we saw public officials abuse public resources for personal gain, but we also saw politicians so as potential to care and we saw and experienced a display of deep senses of solidarity and community by society. Hoffman and Moshe's friendship not only has a feel-good factor about it, but it is also a source of hope that with empathetic political leadership, poverty, increasing inequality, and corruption in our region can be overcome. One of interesting questions that should draw attention of all of us regarding Hoffman and Moshe's friendship is, how do we explain the fact that two, two men from different backgrounds could be so in agreement in their abhorrence for injustice, also given uh, differences in their material circumstances?
Europeans who interacted and interacted with Mushesha one can be classified into many categories, including people are referred to as his acquaintances, admirers, diplomatic contacts, and sympathizers. Calling them acquaintances and diplomatic contacts in no way diminishes the value of their relationship with Mushesha, nor the value of their support to Basuto's cause when they offered one. Others were his friends, and they would include three men in particular, namely the Paris Evangelical Missionary Society missionary, Eugene Casalis, a settler farmer who settled on Mushesha's land, and first president of the Orange Free State, Josias Philip Hosman, and a Free State emissary and Cape Colonial official James, jo, Joseph, sorry, Joseph uh, Millard Open. Little doubt, accounts of Mushesha's relationship with all these men would raise a lot of interesting questions in our minds about humanity. But stars of this evening's show are Hoffman and Mushesha Wan. Based on what he said and did in defense and support of Mushesha and his people's cause, it is clear that Hoffman was an empathetic and good-hearted, even kind-hearted human being endowed with matching consciousness and intellect. All this contributed greatly to his outlook in which racial and cultural differences seem to have mattered little, seems to have had little influence, sorry, seems to have had little influence on how he related to, interacted definitely with Mushesha One. How Hoffman's personality, views, and attitude towards injustice had developed is a difficult question that can be answered only if a number of complex questions are addressed. And there are questions that we can ask of all personalities and dispositions of all individuals. Was the disposition natural to Hoffman and a result of just the way he was wired at conception? Was the dispossession a result of socialization, that is, upbringing, education, childhood, and early adult, adulthood interactions and relationship with others? Did Hoffman work on his personality and principles which he stuck to and lived by? Did his personality and disposition develop in encounters, experiences, interactions, processes, and relationships implied in all these questions. Hoffman was born in 1807 in Cape Town, in the Cape Colony then. According to Joel George McCall Till, he had not the advantage of more than a very limited education from books, but he was naturally shrewd and clever. I think today we'd just say intelligent. Uh, clever and um, having acquired <laughs> doji meanings. Um, he, was, uh, he was naturally shrewd and clever um, and eloquent and reasonably facile with a pen. In his youth, he worked at Cape Town Harbor where he suffered an injury to his leg that forced him to use uh, crutches all his life. He became an itinerant trader and travel as far as Natal selling his merchandise. Sources describe him as having been a self-made and well-to-do man of standing among white settlers of the Mohokara Valley. Hoffman was also good with his hands and could build houses. He built churches at a number of PEMS mission stations where Basutu were congregants, congregants and built a house for Mushashawan himself. He settled in the area of modern, modern Smithfield in 1847, and in disputes 
of ownership of land in that area recognized his farm as part of Moshoshawan's territory. Hoffman met Mushesh in the early 1840s through Casalis. Almost certainly, Hoffman's experience of building churches must have been one of the reasons his and Casalis' paths met. Leonard Thompson described Hoffman as having had an unusual empathy for Mushesh. In 1854, Mushesh described him as a man who, by his many years of experience, was intimately acquainted with all Basotho's laws and customs. Hoffman's intimate acquaintance with Basotho laws and customs included speaking enough Sesotho to be able, in the late 1840s, to translate to Sesotho statements that the High Commissioner wanted conveyed to Moshoeshu. In most sources, words and phrases such as friend, friendship, and the man in whom Basotho placed great confidence are used to describe the relationship between Hoffman on the one hand and Mushashwe and his people on the other. Peter Sanders described Hoffman as a great friend of Mushashwe I. In 1852, Mushesha charged his people a levy in order to pay a colonial fine. Hoffman contributed eight cattle to that levy. When colonial officials asked him why he helped Mushesha, Hoffman described himself as a friend to Mushesha. Again, in 1855, when he commended Mushesha I as a peace-loving and influential chief worthy of British officials' respect and esteem, he described himself, Hoffman described himself as a special friend of Mushesha I. When the British declared territory between Sinku and Lekwa, that's Orange River and Lekwa for some, as their territory, and named it the Orange River Sovereignty in 1848, Hoffman became chairman of the settlers Volksrad. I need to say that carefully. Volksrad. As the British prepared to withdraw their power over the ORS, Hoffman became head of the provisional government during the period 1853 to 1854. And then the first president of the Orange Free State from August 1854 to February. 1855. Hoffman reached these heights of power, notwithstanding the fact that among some settlers, Hoffman's disp disp dispositions towards Basotho and the Free State's other enemy, i.e. the British, um, and him treatment with suspicion, and, and him characterizations such as a ten coat. Among those group among those groups and individuals, he was regarded as too British in orientation and too soft on Moshe and was seen as undermining the superiority of Europeans over Africans by establishing and maintaining a relationship um, with Moshe Shawan. His relationship with Moshe Shawan and, and him an even more serious characterization of being a kefa intriguer. That is to say, a man who was in cahoots with kefas to hedge plots against the newly established Orange Free State. According to those who wrote about him in the 20th century, he was never a patriot and Republican enough. For his fairness towards Basotho and Mushesha, yeah. 
for his friendship, for his fairness and for his fairness towards Basutu and Mushweshwe, Till described Hoffman unflatteringly, I think, as a man whose ideas of diplomacy were those of the 17th and not of the 19th century. Hoffman's friend, Moshe Shawan, is a subject of a number of biographies and other writings from which we have an idea of his personality and values that guided his conduct in, dealings, in his dealings with others. Accounting for development of Moshe Shawan's personality and, by, and values by which he lived, ruled and related with others, demands attention to questions such as those uh, raised in connection with Hoffman above. Regarding his socialization, we know he received an important part of, tuition, of his tuition at what Max Dupree has usefully called Moshe Leadership Academy. At Moshe's Academy, Moshe's heart and intellect were implanted value by value, virtue by virtue, with principles that guided him throughout his life. As in the biblical parable of the sower, the seeds of the academy fell on deeply plowed, receptive, and fertile ground. It germinated and bore fruit that was values that suffused wage in which Moshe Shawan conducted himself. Central to all tuition Moshe Shawan received from Moshomis from Moshomi were justice, fairness, and the idea and practice of peace and peaceful resolution of disputes. Moshe Shawan was not just a product of his wiring at the beginning, nor just a product of influences of his social and physical milieus, but he had taken part in the making of the person he became by asking Moshomi questions. The wisdom he solicited and received from answers to these questions not only helped him shape his thoughts and views on, on life, but, also, but it also put him on the way to practice and elaborate further on what he learned and ideas that he formed. Anyhow, he became as well on, on him shows an empathetic human being and leader of high integrity who held very enlightened views on many social subjects and in his dealings with others. As is always the case with all genuine and uncalculating friendships that are not motivated by personal gain, we are not able to say quite what made it possible for friendship to develop between the two men, or if it was the friendship was up to them, what it was about Moshe Shwe that made Hoffman feel that he wanted to be friends with him, or what it was in Hoffman's personality that Moshe Shawan, that made Moshe Shawan feel that he wanted to be friends with Hoffman. What sources suggest is that either immediately the two men met, or more likely, after conversations over issues of the day, including relations between settlers and Basotho, Hoffman developed the view that in dealing with Moshe Shawan, nothing but moral force was needed. In another statement that bore his understanding of Moshe Shawan's character, in 1855, when war threatened between Basotho and free state, free state settlers, Hoffman told the British High Commissioner that so long as Moshe Shaw lives, there will never be an occasion for such a war. It might be this, a personality amenable to moral persuasion and an awe like that made Hoffman to become friends with Moshe Shawan. What is clear and beyond any doubt is that between the two men, each regarded the other 
as an honorable and even noble person. In order to describe British and settlers' acts and methods of seizure of Basutu's land as unjust, we need to agree on what is and what is not just. This is difficult because conclusions about what is just can be based on subjective assessments. But we can agree that we all like to be, treat, to be treated fairly. We ourselves all want our methods, actions, and conclusions to be objective and impartial based on objective considerations. In these struggles against subjectivity and bias, one of the most important criteria that are agreed has been fit to be used to judge whether or not an act, arrangement, process, outcome, etc., is just or unjust, is that the perpetrator must wish for themselves acts, methods, and outcomes of what they do to others. This understanding of human interaction is different from a statist, diplomatic, and nationalist views in which questions of justice and injustice are subordinated to the notion that states and statemen, states and statemen do what they must do. And as in international law, might is right. Those who follow the latter understanding of human interaction may therefore hold views, present facts, and interpretations that may portray as unhelpful efforts to describe as unjust Mushweshwe and his people's loss of land, along with methods used to achieve that goal. In other words, they may say ideas of fairness and justice do not apply in the case such as Hoffman and Moshoshawan tried to deal with, preferring instead statist and diplomatic conceptions and views. It is clear that these are not standards Moshoshawan and Hoffman uh, used. Given the subjectivities and other difficulties that can surround definitions of what is and what is not injustice, it becomes useful when, as in the case of particularly British officials' seizure of Basutu's land, there is evidence that perpetrators themselves admitted, albeit sometimes obliquely, that their acts, methods, and outcomes were biased in favor of white settlers even if these perpetrators might not accept that outcomes of their actions and methods constituted injustice. To facilitate, hopefully, our own assessment of whether or not we can agree with Hoffman and Moshe that seizure of Basutu's land constituted injustice and had to be opposed, I summarize some acts of seizures of Basutu's land below. Syria's British and settlers grab of Basutu's land began in the 1830s. From this time, British subjects known as four trekkers arrived in the Mohokara Valley and the British began grabbing land, Basutu's land to the benefit of incoming settlers. This continued throughout the 1840s and the 1850s. So, in 1845, Mushesh I and British High Commissioner Peregrine Maitland signed a treaty in which Mushesh demanded and the British promised removal of white settlers from Basutu's territory. In fact, however, Maitland never signed the treaty and the British, the British never alerted Mushesh of this. The treaty, for that reason, was null and void. British treachery on this occasion included their recognition of independence of chiefs 
who African chiefs, that is, who acknowledged Moshe One's authority with a view to enable them to sign land and boundaries treaties without Moshe's authority. In 1848, in one case of a boundary arbitration following the declaration of the Orange River Sovereignty in 1848, um, on that, in that year, the British, a British official declared that, in my opinion, the Boers have more right to the land than Mosheshe. And he made this declaration on the basis of evidence from the settlers only, and without having heard and considered Basutu's view on the matter. This was the year 1848, was the year also when Mosheshe I turned down British officials' suggestion that he should accept monetary payment in lieu of white settlers' occupation of Basutu's land. The following year, 1849, the British decreed a boundary between Lesotho and the Orange River Sovereignty, and that boundary came to be known as the Warden Line, named after Henry Douglas Warden, the British resident to the Orange River Sovereignty. The line detached from Lesotho all land which Basotho and the settlers, the British, sorry, all land which the British and the settlers considered part of the ORS occupied by settlers regardless of Basotho's claims and regardless of how many Basotho lived there before white settlers came. The British threatened Basotho with war if Basotho resisted that boundary. Warden later admitted that his line distressed Basotho and not the settlers. In 1854, the British withdrew their sovereignty over the ORS, which now became the Orange Free State, and handed, the British handed over to the Free Staters all territory they, the British, had taken from Basotho from the 1840s. They, the British, repudiated all their treaties with Basotho and enforced their false claim that Basotho were banned from purchasing arms from British sources. As the British withdrew their rule of the ORS, the Free Staters asked, asked the British the extent of territory that they were bequeathing to the Free Staters. According to Thiel, the British had no plan to do any such determination, and all the Free Staters could draw from the British was an expression that the Free Staters could depend on, could depend on the justice of Mosheshe. To, um, to come up for fair and just boundaries. So they knew he was a just man. Even they knew he was a just man. Better armed and enjoying British support, in years that followed 1854, the, British, the Free Staters took more territory from Basotho, who the British denied access to British sources of better arms and ammunition. In 1864, British High Commissioner Philip Woodhouse intervened in another boundary dispute between Basotho and the Free Staters. Afterwards, he admitted to his son that his settlement was quite in favor of the Boers. At the end of 1865 67 war between Basotho and the Free Staters, warring parties agreed to British. High Commissioner Woodhouse arbitration in negotiations that bore what came to be known as the Aliwal North Treaty. For purposes of negotiation, Woodhouse agreed with the Free Staters 
that Basoto and the PEMS missionaries should be excluded from participation in the talks. Woodhouse, yes, Woodhouse agreed with them. Left alone um, to represent Basoto, Woodhouse allowed the Free State to keep all land that Basoto lost to the British and the Free State from the 1860s to 1865. According to a Free State newspaper, The Friend, I don't know whether it's still here, The Friend. According to a Free State newspaper, through the 1869 treaty, Basoto lost a large portion of their beautiful country. Outcome of Woodhouse's intervention left Mushashawan sorely disappointed and he declared, I am left with a small portion of my country which is overcrowded with uh, people. Given that the struggle for land was central to disputes between Basoto on the one hand and the British colonial officials and white settlers on the other, perhaps the greater service Hoffman rendered rendered Mushesha and his people was his recognition, was his recognition and endorsement of Basoto's right to territory they claimed in these disputes vis-a-vis -vis white settlers' territorial claims. Unlike other white settlers, when he first settled in the Mohokai Valley, Hoffman readily accepted that the land he settled on belonged to Mushashawan and Basutu, and asked Mushashawan's permission to settle on the bank of the Caledon Arms. At West, the ferocity with which the free, staters, the free state forces fought was such as to lead observers to the conclusion that free state government's aims were genocidal and included not only annihilation of Basuto's chiefdom, but also their extermination as a people. Hoffman was appalled. In February 1867, he described free state government's war, war intentions as a hellish plan of destroying, rooting out, and driving away the Basotos. For his part, Mushashawan valued Hoffman's support and friendship immensely, and whenever opportunity presented itself, expressed his appreciation or begged his friend. In 1852, when officials of the Free State Government accused Hoffman of influencing Moshe Shawan against peace and towards violation of terms the British had imposed on Basoto, Moshe Shawan commended Hoffman to the British officials as a loyal supporter of the British cause and a man who had always recommended to Moshe Shawan the path of peace. Aware that his friendship with Hoffman might undermine the credibility of his testimonial on Hoffman's behalf, and eager to have his words regarded as those of an unbiased observer, he added to his remarks words to dispel accusations that he, that he might be biased because Hoffman stood up for him in the past. In themselves, these added words represented not only Moshashawan's attempt to stand by his friend, but they were also testimony to how Hoffman had fought in Moshesha's corner over the years. I am sorry to hear, Moshesha said, I'm sorry to hear that Mr. Hoffman has been accused of having advised me not to comply with your conditions, i.e. conditions of denying Basutu gums and admonition, and had brought me gunpowder I beg you will give neither of these accusations any credence. Although Mr. Hoffman may have spoken in my, my behalf when he thought I was injured, I'm bound to say that in his intercourse with me, he has always been true to the cause of the British government and has always recommended me invariably to, and has recommended me invariably, sorry, 
to use every endeavor for the restoration of peace and a good understanding between myself and the British government. In 1854, with Hoffman's leadership facing challenges, Mushoshawan had occasion to stand up for him and tell Hoffman's fellow free status that Hoffman had qualities of honesty, sticking to the truth, and standing his ground even in times of political agitation. I have, Mushashawan said, I have noticed that Mr. Hoffman has feeble limbs and must use crutches. But when all persons who were blessed with sound limbs kept running backwards and forwards in times of disturbance, that gentleman stood his ground, stuck to his farm, and honestly adhering to the truth, fearlessly admonished and reproved at one time myself and other time the British government. And though many, both of the blacks and whites, envied, hated, and persecuted him, he continued with his family to enjoy safety in the midst of all challenges and tumults. Of course, it is likely that rather than help Hoffman's case, Moshashawan's intervention on his behalf had the opposite effect on those of Hoffman's fellow free status who regarded his friendship with Mushashe as prisoners. Notwithstanding Free State settlers' doubts about Hoffman's loyalty to the Free State's policies and towards Basotho, Hoffman was elected as the president of the Orange Free State in 1854. It is difficult to explain why, despite the misgivings his fellow settlers had about him, Hoffman was elected to the position. Specifically, it was his relationship with Mosheshe that cost Hoffman his job. In August 1854, Hoffman had visited Mushoeshoe I on state business, and Basutu had honored him with a gun salute. At the end of the visit, Mushoeshoe I asked Hoffman for gunpowder to replace quantities that Basutu had used to welcome him. With concurrence of free state officials who were with him, Hoffman agreed and later sent gunpowder as promised. This gesture presented groups opposed to him with a pretext to impeach Hoffman and force him to resign as president of the Orange Free State in February 1855. I think that comes about to about eight months uh, since being elected to that office. It is not difficult to see that the understanding that existed between, between Hoffman and Moshe Shewan held enormous potential for peaceful coexistence between Basotho and white settlers based on a just distribution of land and other natural resources that would have formed a basis for prosperity for all in the Mohokare Valley. Two of Moshe's biographers who commented on Hoffman and Moshe's relationship and its implications for justice, peace, and equitable distribution of land are agreed that Hoffman's impeachment was a major setback in the search for justice, prosperity for all, and peaceful coexistence in our region. According to Leonard Thompson, Hoffman's impeachment, Hoffman's impeachment eliminated the one slight prospect that Mushoeshoe had of negotiating a comprehensive settlement with a free state government that understood his problems and respected his integrity. For his part, for his part, 
Peter Sanders observed that among the people of Lesotho, news of Hoffman's enforced resignation gave rise to a sudden, sudden panic, for it was widely believed that the Free State were preparing to attack, were preparing to attack, sorry, and even when this died down, there was still a legacy of hiding tension. Mushesha understood perfectly well why Hoffman had been overthrown and his confidence in the Free State authorities was badly shaken. Territory the British handed to Basutu as their country in 1869 represented failure of Hoffman and Mushesha's once struggle for justice in the Mohogare Valley. How much toll this failure visited on the two men's senses of justice is difficult to establish. From the 1840s, Mushesha One had made a series of, of concessions to the British and held out the possibility that these concessions would pay off, would pay off somehow. He was routinely disappointed. This frustrated, frustrated and hurt him greatly. Having initially been elated that Woodhouse in 1869, that Woodhouse had proclaimed British protection over his people, in months that followed, he slid into depression when he realized that the boundary Woodhouse and the Free State had agreed, agreed in 1869 Alwal North Treaty was that boundary was described as being non-negotiable. In, in March 1869, his son, Tladi, described his father as being in his second childhood and as being unable to comprehend what was going on. Perhaps this dementia due to old age protected him from fully comprehending that injustice he had fought against all his life had prevailed, had prevailed. In this way, perhaps, he was spared from suffering even greater pain. As the younger of the two men, Hoffman must have been better aware of events and developments surrounding Britain's colonization of Basutu and their territory, much of which they had lost to the British who handed it over to the Free State. Having stood by Mushashawan and Basutu in their struggle for just and equitable distribution of land since the 1840s, he must have seen that the colonial boundary established in the Aliwal North Treaty left Basotho land that was inadequate for living in prosperity, a prospect that he and Mushashwe had fought against for many years. He is therefore unlikely to have been happy. He is likely to have been happy though that by extending British protection to Basotho, the colonial officials had stopped Free State's hellish plan, had stopped British, British Free State's hellish plan, hellish plan. As the missionary Reverend Dr. John Philip had warned as early as 18, 1842, it was a plan at the end of whose execution the Free State shall have exterminated tribes who live under Mushashawan's protection and got possession of the country of Mushashawan. Thank you. you can see me. If you can't see me, hopefully you can hear me. 
So after this insightful lecture, it is my task to do the vote of thanks as the evening draws to a close. First and foremost, I would like to thank our speaker, Professor Matlatsi Tabani, for saying yes to our requests and invitation and sharing his thoughts on the friendship between Josias Hoffman and Meshweshwe the First and what we may still learn from it in contemporary times. Tonight has been a very special occasion for us as it marks the first time we have had an in-person memorial lecture since 2019. So we're quite happy to have been able to have uh, Professor Mutlatsi Tabani to celebrate this occasion. Um, Professor Tabani, here with a small token of our appreciation for saying yes to us and delivering the lecture tonight. I would also like to thank the following guests who made time in their busy schedules to attend the Moria Lecture tonight. Members of the University Executive and Top Management, from the Faculty of Humanities, our Dean, academic heads of departments, colleagues and students from the Bloemfontein and Kwakwa campuses, notably our colleagues from the Seagas Kwakwa. We are very happy that you are here tonight. Staff and students from our sister faculties at the University of the Free State and Support Service Divisions, our international guests from the Decolonial International Network, as well as members of the History Department from the National University of Lesotho, who traveled all the way to be here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. And then in our midst, we also have grade 10 pupils from the Lekholong Secondary School, um, with, along with their teachers who came especially for the lecture tonight. And then staff from the National Museum and other com community members and stakeholders also made time to attend the, the lecture tonight. Now, colleagues and friends, your attendance at important university events such as this is always greatly appreciated. To the students of the University Choir, um, thank you for this wonderful performance and sharing your wonderful talents um, with us tonight. I think we can agree that we have talented students at the University of the Free State. And finally, I have to thank everyone involved in the arrangements for tonight. I would like to thank all the staff from the Center for Gender and Africa Studies who played a role, but especially Dr. Munirati Mashonga, um, Portia Khailele, Ankia Bradfield and Belinda Jacobs. Your contributions are always highly valued. Last but not least, to Alicia Pinar, thank you for your vital support in the organizations of events such as these. If I've um, omitted anyone, my apologies. Please know that any and all contributions are always highly appreciated. I would now like to request all guests to remain seated for a moment to allow the procession to leave the venue but please stay and join us for a small reception afterward. Thank you and good night. <laughs>